Okay, I'm on to chapter six of Chris Hedges' The Death of the Liberal Class. This is the last chapter in the book, and its title is Rebellion, though it should be The Apocalypse, because that's actually what it sounds like. He starts off with this statement. He says, all resistance must recognize that the corporate coup d'etat is complete. We must not waste our energy trying to reform or appeal to systems of power. This does not mean the end of resistance, but it does mean some very different forms of resistance. I think he thinks this is what most of the uh, remaining active liberal class does, is um, call for reforms and appeals to systems, appeal to systems of power. Um, in other words, acting as sort of a, a mild irritant on the system while really not doing anything at all. So the next time you get that email from your um, community organizer telling you to write another letter to your congressman, um, think of Chris Hedges because that's basically what he's talking about. Things like that, working within the political system. And there's his anarchism coming out. He doesn't think that type of activity is um, nearly good enough. In this chapter, you get some commentary on the environment, which he's mentioned a few times before, but that hasn't been the main theme of this book, except to note that um, the growth of corporate power has harmed the environment and is part of the destructiveness of it. But here he makes some um, fairly dire predictions in this chapter, which is why it truly is apocalyptic. He says, our environment is being dramatically transformed in ways that soon will make it difficult for the human species to survive. We must direct our energies towards building sustainable local communities to weather the coming crisis, since we will be unable to survive and resist without a cooperative effort. The liberal class, which clings to the decaying ideologies used to justify globalism and imperialism, which has refused to defy the exploitation or galvanize behind militants to halt the destruction of the ecosystem, has become a useless appendage. Now, remember, this was uh, written in 2010 or published in 2010, not long after the, uh, the stock market collapse and um, um, the economic crisis that, uh, that this, the American people were in and certainly remembered at this point and which Hedges no doubt took to be the sign of worse things to come. Now, we did and have somewhat recovered from that, but you do realize, though, that it's been uh, kind of a weird recovery. Um, we went through the longest period of quantitative easing, uh, basically printing money and uh, low to no interest rates in order to very, very, very slowly come out of that. And of course, in the process, the economy was transformed again. And a lot of people have um, entered the, the so-called gig economy. People are employed, but not necessarily in great jobs. So it's not the greatest, but it, it didn't, it hasn't been a death spiral as, uh, as he seems to predict in places in this chapter. In fact, he actually says the death spiral, which will wipe out whole sections of the human race, demands a return to a radical militancy that asks the uncomfortable question of whether it is time to break laws that, if followed, ensure our annihilation. So, of course, he reminds us that the liberal class has fallen down on the job. It has been bought off. It has bought into basically the same ideological faith in the market as uh, the, where problems will be solved um, and has, quote, handed away the rights of the working class and the middle class, end quote. Next, he becomes prophetic. He says, um, with its reformist and collaborative ethos, the liberal class lacks the capacity or the imagination to respond to this discontent. It has no ideas. Revolt because of this, will come from the right, as it did in other eras of bankrupt liberalism in Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Tsarist Russia. That this revolt will be funded, organized, and manipulated by the corporate forces that caused the collapse is one of the tragic ironies of history. But the blame lies with the liberal class. Liberals, by standing for nothing, 
made possible the rise of inverted and perhaps soon classical totalitarianism. Then, as if that wasn't apocalyptic enough, um, Hedges turns towards an argument that I will give a moniker to, a sort of shorthand name, um, The Benedict Option. Uh, that is a book, while I'm talking, I'll look up the author's name, but it's a book that became popular amongst certain Christians um, earlier this year, and maybe it was, maybe it was published the year before. Uh, but it's about uh, basically the notion there is society is is going going to hell. Basically, uh, Christians are going to have to kind of hole up and and create communities amongst themselves in order to survive um, more or less a coming dark ages, and uh, and and they have to act kind of like the monasteries of the medieval period and safeguard learning. Uh, you know, literally safeguard knowledge uh, for the future. Yeah, Rod, Rod Dreher is the author of The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation. And that, that was a book written just this year, 2017. So, but here we have Chris Hedges saying something similar about seven years earlier. Um, he says... Um, as communities fragment under the weight of internal chaos and the increasingly dramatic changes caused by global warming and economic despair, they'll face a difficult choice. They can retreat into a pure survivalist mode, a form of primitive tribalism without linking themselves to the concentric circles of the wider community and planet. This retreat will leave participants as morally and spiritually bankrupt as the corporate forces arrayed against us. It is imperative that like the monasteries in the Middle Ages, communities nurture the intellectual and artistic traditions that make possible a civil society, humanism, and the common good. Access to parcels of agricultural land will be paramount. We will have to grasp, as the medieval monks did, that we cannot alter the larger culture around us, at least in the short term, but we may be able to retain the moral codes and culture for generations beyond ours. It's interesting that he says that um, we will have to have access to parcels of agricultural land. Um, I assume because we will have to learn how to actually feed ourselves and if we're going to survive and, and be independent to a certain extent of the corporate power, the corporate uh, elites having control, it would have to be through um, actually having the resources to provide for ourselves. Um, that's just interesting. Um, he also predicts something that uh, reminded me of a book from a different angle, and I'll get that up and look at it while I'm thinking of it as well, um, if I can. The title of that book is Archaeofuturism. Uh, which I read a while back because its author is one of the inspirations for the new right. Um, Guillaume Fay, Archaeofuturism, European Visions of the Post-Catastrophic Age. Also published in 2010, it says here, or at least in paperback it was, but I think this is a book that goes back a little further than that. Um, no, maybe not. Anyway, so in that book, uh, Faye, he talks about how we won't be able to sustain the level of development um, even in the Western world, let alone continue to extend that to the rest of the world. It will be unsustainable, um, especially environmentally, uh, but economically unsustainable as well. And, and he predicts that and kind of advocates that uh, we do engage in a sort of tribalism in which people in different parts of the world live very differently and kind of coexist um, with the centers in Europe uh, being in this uh, future development of high technology, uh, relative, you know, mechanization and comfort. In other parts of the world, um, going back to a tribal way of life, very simple and primitive, and uh, the one thing that struck me about that book um, was that 
Faye uh, seems to think that people would be okay with that kind of um, coexistence. So I'm not sure I, I I'm not sure I can agree with that. Um, it is it seems to me kind of a classic of the new right, um, and and in a way, uh, we, so Faye looks at it positively. This is a way that we can preserve civilization and we can sort of live together, not bothering each other, not exploiting each other, um, having our own national identities. And we have hedges on the other side of this calling such things privileged little islands where some will have access to security and goods denied to the rest of us. So same thing being seen from two different angles. I find that interesting. Hedges then moves on to what are people to do to resist the corporate state? And he advocates nonviolent acts of disobedience. He says nonviolent acts of disobedience and the breaking of laws to disrupt the corporate assault on human life and the ecosystem will keep us whole. But he says also, once we use violence against violence, we enter a moral void. So he does not advocate um, the use of violence generally. Although in here you get the sense that he's not a complete pacifist, that there are points in time when it is necessary to use violence, but not as a strategy, apparently, not as a strategy to oppose this. Because after all, they, it, his reasoning is also... At this point, the state has all the power. Um, it has enough power, the so-called corporate state, um, that any sort of resistance to it by individuals or groups really would be met with too much force anyway. It's not really possible. He addresses the phenomenon of, of a sort of soft totalitarianism or inverted totalitarianism, uh, invoking Sheldon Wolin's idea again. And... This is to kind of answer the question, why is it that most people remain in a state of disbelief and aren't where Chris Hedges is about the situation, but um, kind of living their lives without really um, realizing that they are living in a different country than, than they were before, or that this country is different, what they imagine might be, might be another way of saying it. He calls that magical thinking, and he identifies it with a sort of uh, accelerationist way of thinking, um, meaning uh, that refers to uh, this faith that progress is is inevitable and infinite, um, and that we can kind of work ourselves out of any any problems that we create for ourselves through the use of well, what Jacques Ellul would call technique or planning or you know furthering. Um, technology. He says this magical thinking coupled with its bizarre ideology of limitless progress holds out the promise of an impossible, unachievable happiness. It, it has turned whole nations such as the United States into self-consuming machines of death. Wow. So like what he, what he means by this, I believe, is that, um, well, there's probably multiple things going on here, but he has definitely criticized the tendency of Americans to be consumers and to use the consumption of both things and entertainment as a way of, of avoiding having a real understanding of the world around them and what's going on in, in, in and around them and their country. But also... I'm sure he also means that they are complicit uh, in their obliviousness to the destruction that the country is doing, in his view, um, to the environment as well as to other countries with the uh, military might wielded uh, by their country. So knowing what we know about hedges, I'm sure he means all of that, um, but it's quite an um, quite an eye-opening turn of phrase. He also says we have been entranced by the celluloid shadows on the walls of Plato's cave. Um, I, I like that turn of phrase as well um, because say what you will even if you don't agree with um, Hedge's apocalyptic uh, level of despair here uh, about the prospects for the future it's kind of hard to argue that we haven't 
that large numbers of, of people in the Western world in particular have given over to, um, I guess, entertainment and spectacle and show. Uh, and in fact, we tend to treat our political our political uh, life as a as a show or spectacle of sorts. Um, in other words, like a, almost like a reality TV show that that's partly about entertainment. Um, he also uses the term opiates, as in opiates of the masses. Remember, Karl Marx used that term. Well, he throws that in there as well. Um, let's see, he says, once credit dries up for the average citizen, once massive joblessness creates a permanent and enraged underclass, once the cheap manufactured goods that are the opiates of our community commodity culture vanish, once water and soil become too polluted or degraded to sustain pockets of human life, we will probably evolve into a system that closely resembles classical totalitarianism characterized by despotic fiefdoms. So again, that's pretty um, dire, right? He is not one to soft pedal what he thinks. And while maybe the, um, the spiraling hasn't happened as fast as Hedges would have thought in 2010, I doubt if he would say that he was wrong at this point. Many of the items here are arguably still serious. I would say the pollution angle might be might be one of those things um, that our societies just hadn't quite come to terms with yet. But he goes on to um, to predict societal collapse and he says collapse this time around will be global. We will disintegrate together. The 10,000 year experiment of settled life is about to come to a crashing halt and humankind, which thought it was given dominion over the earth and all living things, will be taught a painful lesson about the necessity of balance, restraint, and humility. There is almost no human monument or city ruin more than 5,000 years old. Civilization, Ron White notes in A Short History of Progress, occupies a mere 0.2% of the two and a half million years since our first ancestor sharpened a stone. So he really, really um, hits a lot of nerves here. Right? This is an extreme prediction. Um, he's got to be feeling like he's um, the, the voice in the wilderness, you know, warning about something that um, that nobody believes in. Uh, I think Hedges thinks that an awful lot of people sleepwalk through their lives and while they're vaguely aware that there's some serious issues out there, refuse to um, face them. And so part of his job is to be as in a way, strident in a good way as he can be to try to get the attention of his readers. I could go on. There's so much in here, but I there's one part here that I'll just leave leave you with. Um, it, it relates back to the environment and agriculture again, which seems to be looming rather large in this chapter. He says, if we build small self-contained structures ones that do as little harm as possible to the environment, we can perhaps weather the collapse. This task will be accomplished through the creation of communities with access to sustainable agriculture, able to sever themselves as much as possible from commercial culture and largely self-sufficient. These communities will have to build walls against the electronic propaganda and fear that will be pumped out over the airwaves. Canada will probably be a more hospitable place than to do this than the United States, especially given America's undercurrent of violence, uh, by which I think he means that it, it would be a, a more dangerous country uh, to try to accomplish living in, in a small uh, community with other people who want to live peacefully um, and not be disturbed. So um, 
Why is sustainable agriculture so important? I think it's just because you don't... So sustainable agriculture is another word for organic agriculture, meaning, you know, using methods that don't require so-called external inputs like artificial fertilizer and water when it doesn't rain and things like that. And uh, while, we, while we tend to think of fertilizer and pesticides and all these things as progress and, and uh, feeding, you know, making us able to feed so many more people, they are things that we then come to rely on. And uh, I think the value of sustainable agriculture for hedges here is that if you can figure out how to grow enough for your own small community without the use of these things, um, using, for instance, natural fertilizer like compost, um, natural pesticides like chickens and whatnot, um, that uh, then you're not beholden to corporate power because you're not you're not buying into the corporate system. Um, therefore, they can't yank those things away from you or raise the prices and make it impossible for you to feed yourself. So strangely enough, I think that it is about, um, definitely about independence. And it, it's an interesting juxtaposition, the idea of sustainability, which is an environmental term that's often associated with more government. Uh, but that's only because in the minds of Americans, it can only be had by government regulation. And it's being juxtaposed with independence or, you know, self-sufficiency. And when you think about that, it's exactly what it, what it could do for people if they could do this. If they could live in small communities and farm sustainably, they could become relatively independent of corporate power, um, at least economically. So anyway, I mean, there's a little bit of a hopeful note in a rather uh, catastrophic sounding ending to this book. Hedges has given us a lot to think about, even if you don't agree with all of it. Who does, actually? If you agree with everything a writer says, you haven't really heard everything they've said. <laughs> but he gives you a lot of food for thought. And so that's why I wanted to feature this book.